This is the Aston Martin DBR1, and at least in the real world, it is about as tear-renderingly beautiful and tear-renderingly expensive as it is possible to get. And for all but a few dozen people, a racing sim is the only way that riffraff like us are going to get anywhere near the thing. That racing sim, however, is Project Cars. Hello fellow sim racers and welcome to You Should Drive, a series where I advocate for racing sim content that, for one reason or another, isn't as popular as it probably should be. In the case of the DBR1, the reason is, quite plainly, the appeal of the sim rather than the car itself, but bear with me on this one. This car drives beautifully. I don't care what you think about Project Cars, this thing gives me a serious case of the grins. You know what? Preconceptions be damned. Project Cars 2 is a fantastic place to experience this particular car. Nothing else quite ticks as many boxes. Stunning, immersion-heavy visuals, a range of classic circuits, and it just feels great to drive. Maybe you could get a similar experience in something like a heavily modded Assetto Corsa, but the only DBR1 out there is a rip, and, well, I'm just going to presume it's total garbage. Here's the thing. This car is special, and in my completely untrained opinion, I think it's pretty special to drive in this sim as well. The real thing was a masterpiece. 250 horsepower from a 3-litre inline 6, skinny 16-inch tyres on period rubber, and all at a svelte 850 kilos. It was noted for its nimble handling by the standards of the day, and while it perhaps lacked a little bit in the pony department compared to the D-Type Jags and the V12 Ferrari 250 Testarossas that it raced against, it had no shortage of success during its short time competing. Aston Martin produced just five chassis from 1956 to 1959. Initially offered with a 2.5 litre engine in 56, but things got more interesting when the regulations moved to allow larger engines and, importantly, dropped the requirement for road going versions to be produced the following year. The DBR1 then was a true prototype, and as soon as the 3 litre equipped DBR1s hit the racetrack, wins came in thick and fast. In its first year, wins at Spa and Nürburgring cemented its place as a real threat, though the big race evaded the mark until their famous victory in 1959 in the hands of Carroll Shelby and Roy Salvadori. When I'm driving a historic car in a racing sim, it's as much a nostalgia exercise as it is a racing simulation. So for me, whether the car stirs the right emotions is probably more important than any other aspect. And that's what's so compelling about this car in this sim. It passes my usual, does it feel fairly plausible test, and importantly, it looks pretty sorted doing it as well. Cars of the day were all about cornering with a restrained but ultimately fairly loutish slip angle, and the DBR1 in Project Cars 2 toes the line between that refined aristocrat and the underground bruiser. By modern standards, you might consider 250 horsepower to be a bit on the light side, especially on the Mistral. But I'm not sure how much more you'd want to try and force through those skinny tyres. It is, unsurprisingly, a bit squirmy on the power, and doubly so when the conditions are less than ideal, which, well, let's be honest with ourselves, is Project Car's biggest party trick. Thankfully, the brakes are surprisingly good, which was something the real car was also known for. And combined with the low weight of the chassis, stopping is much less boaty than some other 1950 cars which you may have driven in various sims. On top of that, the aforementioned baked-in lightness makes for a pretty agile car in the corners, at least by the standards of the time. Body roll is, of course, considerably more than you'd expect from a more modern prototype, but it still feels pretty sharp, and managing weight transfer is nice and intuitive. You'll be slinging it through the fast stuff in no time with a moderate degree of yaw. Such was the style at the time. It'll put a big smile on your face, which, as far as I can tell from photographs, wasn't so much the style at the time. Now, if you don't manage the load transfer well, it does get understeery, particularly in mid to low speed corners. But that's also something that you'd expect from a car of the time, especially those with the engine at the front. But it's not too extreme. 
And if you pair this with a period correct circuit, then well, you'll be flat out for 90% of the time and you won't have to worry about too much of that slowing down business. Now, is it accurate? How the hell should I know? The first chassis recently sold for an eye-watering $22.5 million, so it's not like you or I or anyone we've ever met or anyone we're ever likely to meet or anyone they've ever met is going to be able to weigh in on the subject with any level of authority. And really, I don't think it's all that important. Driving this car feels great and I love doing it. In fact, this is by far my most driven car in Project Cars too. And if you're like me and everything before 1990 takes on a sort of rose-coloured hue, then I think you'll get a kick out of driving this too. 